Hello and welcome back to the Angry Dave Podcast. I am Dave. I'm here with my next guest, the notorious RPG, Mr. Rick. How are you, Rick? I'm great, Dave. It's good to be here. Rick, we know each other through work. Yep. I was your, you were my client. You, I was very reluctant at first, if you recall. Yes, I was. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. You wanted another person who we are both very fond of. Yes. And then I grew on you like the mushroom that I am. If it's, it's, it's because she was better looking than you. <laughs> She's certainly better looking. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> so, yeah. And then it, it turned out it worked out really well. And, yeah. Uh, you know, ultimately uh, she moved on, did something else, but now that's how we met. And the thing I always appreciated about you is that you're a straight shooter. Yeah. I don't like people bullshit. Yeah. And, you know, I drink my coffee black and drink my whiskey straight. Yeah. And, you know, I like people who can be honest with me. You always were honest with me. We had some great calls because I had a personnel matter. It was one of my staff. Yeah. He was an idiot. Yes, sir. And you just kind of laid it out. And I'm like, yeah, he's an idiot. And and you were probably witness to one of my greatest professional tirades where I, I cleared a room. Yes, sir. To smoke a guy. On yeah. my own staff in the middle of a meeting. I've never done that before. I've never done it since. Yeah. But it had to be done. <laughs> no, it had to be done. It was incredible. It was incredible and it needed to be done. And if, if, you know, I mean, you were pushed to the point where I don't think you ever, ever have wanted to be in your professional life. No, no, that was a first. Everybody's yeah. got a first for different things. And that definitely was a first for me. Yeah. So, you know, we met, you were my client. Grew, I respected you tremendously, and I think I always knew it intuitively, but I, you taught me without question that you didn't have to be an asshole, and you can still uh, be serious and do a good job, and, you know, I mean, you sort of proved that to me um, through our relationship in any, in any event, and you sort of, I consider you as a mentor. I don't know if you know that, but I do. No, I appreciate that. And uh, kind of where I'm at in my career, it's always good to hear that I've made an impact on people. Yeah. And I and I feel that I, I've got to do that. Yeah. And we need more people like you and I that are straight shooters and yeah. and aren't, you know, assholes to people, but can still, you know, kind of re- command respect and, and get stuff done. Right. Uh, so I appreciate that. All right. So let's talk about you. I, well, first, you never, you don't have any angry Dave stories, right? I mean, we probably, I've probably been on tirades on the phone with you, but never, never like in public, I don't think. Uh, no, nothing that, you know, professionally, there's some venting professionally that's been <laughs> yeah. outstanding. Yeah. And I think that we've got to let those go to protect the guilty. Yes, uh, I think so too. You know, we've had some cocktails together. We run in together. Yeah. The Eagles games, but I've never had like seen Dave off the hook, Dave. Yeah. I've done a pretty good job in my professional life of uh, hiding that. I don't think people ever realize, yeah, the uh, lengths that I have gone to make a fool out of myself in my life. But in any event, all right, let's talk about you. You grew up in suburban Philadelphia, correct? Yeah, I'm a Delco guy. Talk about that. Talk about early life and just your your family life. What was that like? So my my parents are both blue collar people. My dad, uh, trade school guy, uh, Navy. His, he's the youngest of nine by 11 years. His, yeah. his dad was hit by, my, yeah, my grandfather was hit by a car in 1935 in Altoona. Oh, wow. Yeah, walking back from the speakeasy, what was his legal bar again by that point in time. He yeah. was hit by a car and killed. My, my aunts basically raised my dad. Oh, wow. And then he came to the area and went to trade school down here uh, from out in Western Pennsylvania when he was 18. or He was actually 16. Okay. He started trade school. And so you, you know, blue collar guy, painting contractor, mom, literally the coal miner's daughter Yeah, from coal country up near the Pottsville area. Yeah. And, uh, dad walked out on the family and, oh, wow. uh, yeah, at 18, she took a look at the gene pool for protective husbands up in the area and said, <laughs> I'm out. Yeah. He came to the Philadelphia, came to Philly, actually sight on scene, took a job, kind of the rest is history. Dad married, uh, right before he went into the Navy, kind of a short term thing. Yeah. No kids. And it was funny. It's like, I didn't know about that marriage. I didn't know he was married until I was 21. And and out of the blue, my, my mom decides to tell me on the 
height of rush hour in a Jersey turnpike. <laughs> it just kind of comes out of the blue. So she tells yeah. me that story. So mom, dad, blue collar. And we landed in this little college town in um, Swarthmore in Delaware County. Yeah. Mom and dad are, are not your classic Swarthmore people. So right. how the hell did they wind up there? So it's a great story. And then the builder, my dad, did a lot of work for, uh, owned this house, yeah. sold the house to my dad, and actually held the mortgage. Oh, wow. That, that, that's unheard of, right? So, yeah. So um, great little town. Lived on like a kind of a... It wasn't really cul-de-sac, but it was two streets that, that dead ended and it was like a horseshoe. So it was like a built in playground and there was a bunch of us, right? There was a whole bunch of us kids. Yeah. And my memories of it are, you know, the best are the summers. Right. right? You know, you get up in the morning, get your stuff together. A nice day, mom would like get out of here. We'd go to the swim club. We'd be there until the lifeguards were done with us and threw us out. Yeah. Rainy days, we sat in the back porch and played risk. And then we just like other times we just disappear on our bikes. Right? Yeah. Where are you going? Well, I'm just going to go around the corner. Well, that was like five miles away in the woods behind the mall. Yeah. You know, building camps and, you know, all kinds of mischief. Give us an idea of the time period. It's like 1930s, 40s, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> 60, 60, 70s in, the, in suburban Philadelphia. Well, it's what's great about it. Like the era is like the Flyers yeah. won their first Stanley Cup on my, right. on my sixth birthday. Right. Which is that's forever etched in my mind. And, it was, we had a birthday party at my house, and, yeah. You know, for us six, and there the Flyers won Stanley Cup. I was like, how great was that? And I've been a huge fan ever since. So, like the small town feel was great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll share with you though that I had a learning difference growing up. I don't know if we've ever talked about this. No, but, never knew that. But you know, the educational system at the town was was stupid. They didn't understand what was going on with kids. You hit this really bright, yeah. well-read kid that just wasn't learning like everybody else. Yeah. So, um, and a little a little bit of anxiety, believe it or not. I, yeah. On and off in my life, I've had some anxiety. Me too. I got bullied a little bit. Okay. Um, talk about that like in middle school. I learned a lesson of like, you know, sometimes you get to find the biggest dick in a room and punch him in the face. Yes, sir. And then, you know, you kind of settle the score of everybody. Yep. So now it was a great place to grow up. You know, my parents were blue collar people. They were older. They had me when they were 39, my brother when I was four. They were 41. So 39. My mom was 39 when she had me and 41 when she had my brother. Oh, wow. So they're a little bit, you know, and that was kind of old at that time. Right? Especially that time, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that was a little bit different. So, you know, I was raised by a different era. Their neighbors were not that group. Right. So that was odd. And it was a very, you know, educated, still, you know, a lot of management types from like the industry down, like Sunship and Scott Paper and stuff like that, living yeah. in the community, still a little bit working, but it, it's not that anymore. It's very, right. uh, very academic. Very affluent. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just the typical nonsense. Like I, one of my favorite memories is one year for that Halloween, basically telling mom, nobody had to go with us anymore. Right. And she wanted to give us a little pumpkin, you know, to put candy. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, no, I want a pillowcase. <laughs> I, right. want, I want a pillowcase. Yeah. And we literally would run day from house to house to house. And yeah. We, and we knew like who was going to score. We were going to. Yeah. The, the good places to go. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that, that was a lot of fun. You know, it was a typical big yard with football, football, street hockey, all that bullshit. A lot of kids in, in the sports, that kind of thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, also we did some geeky stuff. Like we got into Dungeons and Dragons and stuff like that. How about, what were you like? What would your parents have said about you when you're like a middle schooler? Oh my God, as a middle schooler, I think they're terrified because I really got into like some, got into music big time. Okay. Grew out the hair. Uh, <laughs> like ACDC was like the, the gateway drug for me. Yeah. And you remember Sam Goody's records? I do. Yeah. So there was one in the mall that, where I lived was like right across from the mall. So I was really into ACDC, and this is like 80, 81, 82. In the record store enough, like, the guy got to know me. Yeah. And I was like, well, what's cool to listen to? And Iron Maiden's Number of the Beast had just come out. <laughs> and, like, all the posters are up. Right. And I'm like, well, they look cool. And he's like, they're really cool. If you like ACDC, you'll love guys, you're going to love these guys. Yeah. So I couldn't afford the new release, Number of the Beast. It was, two, you know, it was like 10 bucks. Yeah. But they had this EP. It was five songs called Made in Japan. Okay. And it was like seven fifty. So, right. So I bought it, but it was with their original singer who'd been on their first two albums. Yeah. I took that home and listened to that and I was like, holy shit. Yeah. And I was playing the bass guitar. I just picked the bass guitar up and I heard Steve Harris play. And it was like, he played the bass like I'd never heard the bass played before. Yeah. And it, that was it. So great story about the metal stuff. Like dad's like a real straight laced dude. We got into Priest, right? Judas Priest. Yeah. 
So we were watching MTV and Priest is on. It's like another thing common is the video. Yeah. Halford's in all the black leather studs. Dad just walks through the room, casually looks in. He goes, you know, that guy is gay, right? And just kept walking. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, oh, oh, what? What? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, sure. So we had, we had the, my brother played guitar. I played bass. And, awesome. Uh, these are people who like Hank Williams Sr., yeah, you know, that was good. Polkas and stuff like that. And then we're, you get the metal band rehearsing in the house. Oh, uh, yeah. We played a bunch of gigs, and it's a lot of fun. What was the uh, band name? What was the band name? Prisoner. Prisoner? Prisoner, yeah. Oh, yeah, Prisoner. That's awesome. All right, so how about how about going into high school? What were you like? What were you into? So it was like a big transition for me. I think, you know, I was still kind of into the music thing. Yeah. But I also, like, really like girls. Right. And figured out, like, you know, girls may have not have been into the headbanger thing. And I was in sports. Like, I played, I always loved football. Yeah. Uh, mom and dad didn't have the money uh, for me to play hockey. I always wanted to play ice hockey. And I, but I got to do that later when I actually had my own money. Right. From that, it was like, okay, you know, maybe like focus on the football thing. So from sophomore year through, I was like to, like to try hard, right? As yeah. We ran an optional offense. I played quarterback because yeah. I was smart, knew how to run it. Right. But then they transitioned to a passing game and I didn't have the arm. Yeah. So my senior year comes along and they're like, we don't know what we're going to do with you. So right. So I wound up making, uh, played varsity, got a lot of snaps at inside backer. Okay. Which, because I was a freaking nutcase during the summer because right. I knew if I didn't like kill everybody at practice. Yeah. At, I you were going to sit the bench. Yeah. 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 And my best, my favorite story about that is we had two freshmen that were the enormous linemen. Yeah. And they wanted to come up off the freshman team and play varsity. Yeah. And they begged. So they, they cut a deal. There's like, we want to come up and go live with one of the varsity guys. Yeah. So they're like, okay, they brought them up. They picked me, the varsity staff picked me as the guy and in practice. You know, you're wearing your, you know, practice jersey. I got a quarterback number on. Right. I got the quarterback bar. And they're like, well, if you can beat the backup quarterback here, then, you know, <laughs> then you can make the team. Right. I fucking mauled them. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So, and, you know, it was, but again, early, like in the middle school age, you know, stuff, middle school kids are just dicks. Yeah, man. And it's like, yeah. you know, they really like get on you about the music you're into. Yep. Especially where I was living. And it was like, now looking back at it, I'm all like, yeah, we really liked all that music you like too, but yeah. you know, it wasn't cool. And, right. You know, it was like, you guys suck. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have great stories about me making fun of the middle school girls about liking new kids on the block. Yeah. And then going home with my best friend and dancing to the new kids on the block <laughs> secretly. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, I was one of those assholes. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> in, a little insecure dickhead. How about the girls? What was what was Rick like with the ladies in high school? Oh, I like the ladies, right? I didn't have like a steady in high school until the end of my junior year. Yeah. And that's a story how it happened. It ties into Rick had through like middle school into like his junior year had a girl in every port. Yeah. Like everywhere I went, like <laughs> my dad, where he was from, yeah. I met a girl up there. She was two years older and this was like eighth grade. So that's the first girl I really made out with. Right. Right. I, eighth grade. And she's a sophomore in high school and she's from there. So we'd write back and forth. Yeah. And then I guess in my junior year, I went on this trip. The, the lead the close up foundation was like, you know, student focused government learning because it really into that. Yeah. And uh, went to Washington, D.C. with a bunch of kids from my, my school, and there's other schools. So I met a girl from Sullivan, Missouri, and she was my girlfriend for that week, <laughs> which, which was great. And we still stay in touch now. She's just a wonderful girl. She actually just uh, I feel old now because she just sent me a message saying, hey, I'm going to be a grandmother. Grandmother, yeah. That's happening. And I'm like, those are the first titties I ever touched. Now she's going to be a grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, these things happen. They're not in the same place as they used to be. No. No. <laughs> no. And then uh, like that, later that, that year, at the end of my junior year, I'd do another like leadership thing. as I was, I was involved in the student council stuff. And, yeah. Because I got it wrong with everybody. Like, you know, I was – because I wasn't that dude. Like, I could just float through the different groups and get along with everybody. Yeah. So, uh, I actually was a student rep to the school board. So, cool. anyway, I go to this leadership thing, and I met a girl uh, from another high school. And this girl played volleyball and basketball, and she's 6'2". Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I'm 5'8", right? Right. And that that was it. That was, like, the, the first love of my life. Right? Really? You know, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever read a lot of Stephen King. 
but he nails like those first love stories. Yeah, like, he does. Bad, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was smitten. Yeah. So that was like the thing until, uh, you know, we graduated and it, we even tried the ploy of like, I was going to go to the same college and I couldn't get in where she was going to go. <laughs> right. Which actually worked out for the better. So right. it kind of fast, we had great relationship, but bad situation for her. She had a, she was raised by her stepmother and her okay. father had died and her mother was out of picture. Yeah. And this, we called, I called the stepmother the step monster. Yeah. Cause she was like in her late thirties and just angry at life. Right. And you know, beautiful daughter and happy and that can't be. Right. So fast. We, we tried to make the long distance relationship work in, in college. Yeah. Got the Thanksgiving, went up to where she was going to college and uh, went to visit her. And it was clear. It was like, this is going sideways. Right. And uh, basically, you know, we have to talk. Yeah. <laughs> Get to readjust the, the relationship. I was like, okay. And then we broke up a week later. Yeah. And I had no intention really of like thinking about Greek life until that point. Right. And oh, that now was all in. That, really? That, oh, dude. And it was, you know, Nicolas Cage and leaving Las Vegas at that yeah. point in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was not a good, the next 18 <laughs> months was not good, my friend. You were just out of your mind? Out of my mind. <laughs> out of my mind and in you know swimming in a vat of peels light you know? yeah peels that's amazing <laughs> all right what's the drunkest story you have from greek life anyone that you would like to share oh my god there's so many of them uh, i it's gotta be waking up one morning after drinking a lot of tequila it was like a thing if you you know you had a bottle of tequila yeah and there was a worm like jose cuervo yeah and I can drink tequila, but not a lot of it. Yeah. So I woke up the next morning after like a, a blind tequila bender in my sophomore year. And I was like, what the hell happened to my hands? My hands were completely like destroyed. And people were like, have you seen the bathroom up in the front house? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> just, and you know, it's like, is that Rick? Yeah. Hey, me, man. Like I just completely like tuned up. Just lost it. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I, I I, to this day, nobody can tell me why. <laughs> right. Yeah. I've had some good ones. Um, there's a point like of just, you know, drinking to a point. Yeah. Um, I've had just some amazing times. And another thing I got into as a volunteer farm out in the county for 20 years. Yeah. I did farm and like to drink. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah, and we had a send off for one of my buddies and it was one of my other buddies is the drunkest I've ever seen this man. And he's about <laughs> as big as Chewbacca. Yeah. And you get a big man like that really drunk on Grey Goose. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, I, I worked for the city for a time. Firemen love their job, number one. Police officers often hate their job. But firemen, let me just say it as mildly as I can, is when I would sit in the employment law meetings, they were an issue. Yeah. Because they there was no boundaries. Yeah. Just no boundaries. And, it, you know, it's a locker room kind of environment. I'm sure it didn't, they didn't mean it any in any way, but anybody that wanted to take advantage of that locker room environment certainly could with an EOC claim. You know, it's funny. As we were walking over here, I was kind of thinking about that very topic. Yeah. Because, you know, the work I do, right? Right. And I'm like, oh, the employment shit with the city of Philadelphia and a fire department. I haven't been a fireman. Yeah. Because there's like a ritual to it, at getting in. You know, it really is, it, it's a family. Yeah. And it's, I loved it because, and that's why I think I took the Greek life. And right. It's almost like Greek life, right? Yeah. I mean, it's similar. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, I mean, like I'm out, I, I was a member over 20 years and I've been out for a while because it's a young man's game, but yeah, yeah those are, we would fight. Dude, we would carry along with each other at times and yeah. then, you know, crying and loving each other. And yeah. Then you'd get a good job and, you know, then it was like, peace out again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good stuff. But that's it. It's like the camaraderie, right? The the relationships. I mean, is that what you miss the most? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, people say, oh, you missed the big fires. Like, no, I don't miss the big fires. I miss, miss the stupid stuff. Yeah. Like going to see the calls, like where somebody does something dumb. You yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I, I have, you know, I ran baseball teams for a long time. It's my first year that I haven't run a team in uh, 20 years, but I often told guys that were moving away from it is, you know, because of the time, whatever, you know, it's, uh, I don't want to do baseball in the morning. It's not about the baseball. It's about the dumb shit. Nobody remembers the results of games. Yeah. It's the dumb shit after the game that you always remember. Oh, yeah. 
you know, same, same kind of thing. Yeah. After playing men's league hockey, beer league, I was able to get to that. I coached for a while. Yeah. I don't know if you remember this, but I, I do. I coached like school age kids. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, middle school and then uh, junior varsity. Yeah. And I tell them that all the time. I'm like, you know, if I'm a successful coach, you know, it has nothing to do with the wins and losses. It's if you're yeah. 50 years old playing beer league. Yeah. You've got buddies. And yep. you're, you're just having a good time. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. I, I, don't get me on my AAU rant, but the eight, your eight U travel teams, I, I can't. It's it, it it's so getting lost in the sauce about what it really means. You know, the 1% of the 1% can really actually make it. So how about we just have a good time? Yeah. Or teaching ki- teach the kids how to have a good time. Life lessons. Yeah, right. You know, like I had this thing where, and some of the parents early on with the younger guys, like I'm talking like nine, 10, 11 year olds. Yeah. I had a rule of, I don't tie skates. Right. I do not tie skates. Right. And some of the parents were like, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah. What I wanted to tell them is, are you still wiping her ass? But, you know, yeah. obviously they weren't. Right. But you know, they have to learn, right? And they have to learn how to be accountable for themselves. Yeah. I'd come down on them. You know how I am professionally, right? right. That same way would carry over into the locker room. Right. When, you know, it hold them accountable. Right. Because if you don't learn how to be held accountable when you're young, you're in trouble when you get older. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's the best thing about team sports is being accountable to each other, you know, and lear- learning those lessons and learning the lessons of being a good teammate and, and pulling your own weight. You know, you talk about high school, you know, I divorced my high school friends my senior year, like the guys I was really close to. Yeah. They're all football players. And two things happened is uh, I worked really hard to get playing time. Yeah. And a bunch of these guys were like, they're smoking way too much weed. Right. And I was, that was never my thing. Right. And it was impacting their performance and play. Yeah. And then I was also like, despite having a learning difference early on, I was a smart guy. I was in honors physics. I had a tu- I had to tutor a bunch of these morons in in basic, <laughs> and they just gave me so much crap over it. Yeah, and it was just like I'm done with you. you right. Know? By the time cr- I got a you know awesome girlfriend, you know I was like I'm done with you guys. So I hung out with the stage crew guys because they were like yeah. and they were cool. You know. Yeah, and, yeah. It's like great senior week because of that. Right. Steve Iraco, I know you know yeah. talked about that about how the athletes, you know, he got hurt really bad, and then nobody like came to his side. But the geeks, you know, or, or the, the, the other dudes were, you know, there, you know, yeah. it's the same kind of deal. I've, I've had that situation too. The musicians were always, seemed to always be a little bit more loyal. I don't know what that's about, but. I think it's the artist brain. Yeah. Because I love, I love music. I love art. I just think that, and my daughter's this way. I mean, she, she's a badger for her personality yeah. and she's empathetic, Yeah, you know, and she's love you, you know, and, but wronger. <laughs> but then she'll come back and she'll love you again. You yeah. Know what I mean, and may, maybe athlete, maybe the athlete thing is because it's so competitive. I don't know. Maybe it's that, that it be, it breeds the competition amongst each other. I don't know. I, I think it's the, this, the, the really good ones get coddled. Yeah. They get told they're special. Yeah. I, I don't believe in doing that, man. You can't, no. you can't do that, especially when you're young. Well, and I think if you're special, if you're actually truly special, it doesn't help you. Yeah. It doesn't help you if you really have a chance to make it. Not being coddled is the way you're going to make it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, throw you in the next. You throw you in the pool with the next highest level. Yeah, I mean, I see this with martial arts, judo. I see these people like lying about their kid's age, lying about their kid's weight. Why? Now, who? First of all, judo. You, you know, you win a gold medal. Great, it's a beautiful medal, and nobody gives a f- flying fuck about it. So you're not certainly not getting a shoe deal out of judo. <laughs> so what are we, what are we doing? I mean, just, you know, if you want to teach your kid how to be competitive and, and, you know, to push themselves, then move them up in the weight class or move them up in the age class. Yeah. Well, what are they doing by beating the other, you know, being nine years old and beating seven year olds? What does that, how does that help? There's, it does nothing. And my parents were definitely never going to be those people. Yeah. I mean, mine either. Nope. <laughs> never going to happen. Um, all right. So you're in college. Talk to me about moving through college and, uh, what do you do afterwards? Uh, talk about college is really like a, a, it's a, it's a play in two acts. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I talked about the wheels came off when, uh, the girlfriend and I part. Yeah. And I, I just kind of drifted for a while. And, and frankly, I guess at the, at the beginning of my sophomore year, yeah. like, some of them, my brothers, I love them. Some of them, uh, they just not a great influence. And yeah. I, I started like hanging with a crowd. It was like, this is not good. Yeah. And my enthusiasm about learning was really waning. Yeah. So um, 
I think my mom picked up on it and she, she knew that international travel was important. So, um, we had to take what was called a January term as students where I went to school. Yeah. And, um, there was a trip to Russia, wow. to spend some time in the Soviet union. So, um, and what years, what years are this? Gorbachev was, it, it was mid eighties. So it was the end. It, it, we left the day after Christmas, 1987 and came back in January, 1988. Okay. So we were there for new years, which is part of like the fun. Yeah. Um, and, and I really was like at that point thinking about like, I'd cash my chips in and like I'm out. Like, oh, wow. No more college for Rick. It was a group from where I went to school. I went to a small school, Moravian University in Bethlehem. Um, and there was a couple of us from that, a couple from like Lehigh and a couple other schools. It was so transformative, Dave. Like you, you got to the Soviet Union and it was still, it was communist. And like, I can tell you all the cliches of the stuff that happened. Yeah. You know, like weird stuff in the room and being followed and all that. It, it's kind of true. Yeah. Never colder in my whole life. <laughs> right. But it was an incredible experience. And we kept meeting all these people from all, their, all over the world. And I've never traveled internationally without stumbling over Australians. I don't know what it is about Australians, but anywhere you go, there's an Australian. There's an Australian. Yeah. It's like a rule. There has to be an Australian right. there. So um, I came back from that and I was like, man, was I pumped. Yeah. So, you know, I had a friend group and, um, you know, I knew some people. And there was this one girl that was a, she was a track athlete and she was a star. Her roommate was was seeing one of my roommates at the time. I don't know why, but I just stopped by her room to see her. Right. Well, this, you know, I married her eventually, right? Yeah. So we had this kind of on and off thing that that spring. Um, the roommate and the boyfriend wanted to do a radio show. I was doing a radio show. Yeah. And their radio show was after mine. Okay. So they the, the roommate stopped going and my wife, Sharon, would show up by herself. So I started going earlier to ha help her. Yeah. So that goes on like the whole spring, right? And I'm like. I'm still burnt from the last relationship that hurt. Like I can't imagine like getting close to somebody again. Right. And I'm like, I'm going to screw this up. I just know I'm going to screw this up. Yeah. So there's a spring dance or a spring blowout for my fraternity. And I'm like, Oh man, I really ought to ask her. I don't One of the <laughs> one of the new brothers asked her to the dance. And I'm like, Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Right. So like, she's really not a party person because she's a serious track athlete. Right. They're dancing. I see her kissing this guy and I'm like, Whoa, man, what? Yeah. Son of a bitch. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So I kind of filed that away, you know, kind of put it to rest for the year and, you know, if summer rolls in ex-girlfriend shows up Oh boy! over the summer and yeah. like, I got the big doe eyes and yeah. yeah. You know, and I was smart enough to be like, nah, I can't do this again. Right. I just right. can't. Around the same time, I get this letter out of the blue. It's it's from Sharon. Yeah, and you couldn't like she had it. She was on campus and she went to the registrar's office, and she's yeah. like the straightest person in the world, most honest person. She literally lies to the registrar's office and says, "I need his address because he's going to help me with the school paper where I'm going to be." Wow. And she writes me. That That's song. amazing. So and she goes and tells me about all these guys that are like interested <laughs> in her. So uh, anybody who was uh, before uh, born. After 1994, a letter is something that you would drop in the mail. It's kind of like an email, but you would have to use a pen for it. Yeah, I, st I still have this letter, by the way. And, That's awesome. And we, it's just, we just had the 35th anniversary of her sending it to me. That's amazing. Yeah, and it's like, um, it's kind of funny. And, and it, it, she denies it at the point, but there's a reference where she's like, I'm listening to the mixtape that we did on the radio show, and I heard your voice, and I thought of you, so I wrote you. Yeah. So, boom, like right back in September. Like I'm on a mission. I'm yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So you at least recognized the sign that she might be interested in you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, and from there, it was like you know the spark had started, like the, the joy of learning after the trip to the Soviet Union. Yeah, and then that. Yeah, and, awesome, dude. It it was it. I was you change like a change person. It was a you know it was a story in two acts. My right. college career. So, yeah. So here I am. So. So, all right. So you finished college and what do you do after college? What do you do? I thought about being a lawyer. Did you? For, yeah. 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 And, uh. You didn't miss out. No, I did not. And I know it now. Right. So what I wound up doing is I, my dad, the painting contractor, was, I had a hard time getting a job with a political science major. Yeah. A hard time getting a job right away. My wife went and got her uh, master's degree, but she was close by at Rutgers. I had a couple of buddies from the fire department. They were older. And they were all you know, like insurance guys and loss control, like sprinklers and stuff like that. Yeah. So 
I got my first job doing like property inspections. Okay. Going out and looking at these dumps. Yeah. These, these places are definitely going to burn down type of things and writing them up and sending them back. Like, look, this place isn't sprinkled. It. And it, if an iPad, you had an iPad today and a, and a digital camera, yeah. it's an easy job. But then you'd have to take pictures, yeah. make them, get them developed, and you have to write a report, yeah. send it in, get a type. Yeah. And then I get paid by piece. I couldn't make any money on it. So yeah. from there, you're going to laugh when I tell you this. My first job after that, I worked for a Vogue rehab company. Oh, really? That is <laughs> that's funny. A, that's an inside joke. <laughs> yeah, it is funny. I know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. I spent three years like looking for jobs for workers' comp claimants. <laughs> wow. And then from there, I went to work for a manufacturer. And the guy that hired me was right out of college. He's my age. He was safety manager at this manufacturing outfit. Okay. Can, can you imagine going to work for a guy? He's 25. No. He's your boss. 25 year old is your boss. Right? Yeah. Right. You're, you're, you're both just married. Yeah. You're both like the Eagles. You both like cocktails and you're in charge of safety at a manufacturing. <laughs> <place>. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sounds slightly familiar for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, and I had, a, I had a run at the Bet Boys. I left. I went to the Pep Boys for a couple of years, worked in a risk management shop, and uh, yeah, and then went back to that manufacturing group because they talked me into it, which was a mistake. And then from there, it's like I just I just kept catching breaks, you know? yeah. So and moving up, yeah, you know, my fraternity brothers are like I keep telling them like oh, I I can't believe I'm in the you know because I'm in the risk management profession. I'm like I, I I can't believe I'm in it, and they're like, dude, we know you were going to do this. You were the guy who kept saying, get the tree out of the house, you're going to burn a tree down. Your first <laughs> <was wrong."> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, my friend, my friends uh, say, I, I don't understand how you could ever be do this. You don't pay attention when you're driving. Well, and I say, well, I'm the exact person do you want to be doing this because I know all the bad things you can do. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> so we might come from the opposite end of that. Yeah, so, but so that's what that's that's how I'm here, and you know, I got everybody fooled. <laughs> that's funny. So talk to me. When did kid? When did the kids come? So we waited and. I say to Sharon all the time, I was like, what the fuck did we do with those like six and a half years before yeah. we got married till we had the kids? Yeah. And it's like, we were like old before our time. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, daughter was born in 2000 and son born in 2002. Okay. And, uh, it, but it's funny about both of the pregnancies is not funny. Cause it's like, my wife is like, I want to kill him. I had in the fire service had close calls during both present pregnancies. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. I, 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 She's pregnant with my daughter, and I, I crawled back past a, a door uh, searching for the fire and you know, up on the third floor. I no hose line ahead of the hose line, and uh, I crawled past the door, and I'm like, okay, where am I? I eventually found myself, and we burnt that place to the ground. Yeah. And then uh, when my son was due in 2020, uh, 2002, we had a basement fire that the two uh, new guys with me decided they didn't want to play fireman that day. Uh, and left me at the top of the steps. So, I, you know, as a captain at the time, I dragged the line down and put the fire out by myself. I wound up in the hospital with with heat exhaustion, right? Right. Because my blood pressure was up because they took my blood pressure as I was screaming at these two guys that left me at the top of the steps. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, I wound up in the hospital for that. Yeah. So, that that's uh, when they came along. And, and being a dad, like, yeah. I, you know, like when my daughter was born, um, I've, I've got great memories about her just being like my accessory. Right. I would take her everywhere. Yeah. Be like, yeah, you, know, you know, my wife would be like, can you go do this? I was like, yeah, can I take Lion? Yeah. <laughs> I'd go and take my daughter with me. Yeah. Like in her little path. Yeah. I freaking love that. It was so much fun. And then how, how many years apart are they? Your daughter's older. They're two. They're two. Okay. Almost exactly two years apart. And you and your brother were close like that too, right? Two years apart. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to me about being a dad and, and that era of your life, just growing up, having those two kids. Yeah. So it's being a parent, it can be, it, it, it's so rewarding, Yeah, but you've got to be careful. There's a trap, right? Yeah. Because a, a friend of mine said, you can either screw your kids up or you can screw your marriage up. Yeah. And I, it's like, you start thinking about that, right? It's a delicate balance, man. Yeah, you've got to really focus because we're going through it right now. We have a number of friends that they took the kids to college. The kids went to college. They're standing in the driveway as empty nesters looking at each other going, who the fuck are you? Yeah, right. And how did we get here? Yeah, birds tweeting in the air, right? Like, yeah. 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 And the marriages are falling apart. Yeah. So we really were conscientious about that. Yeah. But, you know, like being a dad – um, like all the cool things you get to do, 
and it's funny like you think you're like your son would be like the guy who i've got a daughter and a son would be like the one who's like always interested in what you do mechanically uh-huh. it's my daughter right <laughs> she's the one who's like she can fix anything yeah absolutely anything um and, my, I- and she's more like me personality wise like right. i said she's she's a badger yeah and then there's my son who takes a little bit more after my my wife but then there's also this dynamic about birth order I'm, yeah. I'm the oldest. My wife is the oldest. Our daughter is the oldest. And then there's this youngest thing. Yeah. We don't understand that youngest. So thing. that's a, that's the same dynamic in our house too, except for our youngest is so thoughtful. He's so like more thought again, more, way more thoughtful than the, the, the oldest kid, you know, we're all the oldest kids, so we're we're sort of self righteous in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, oh well, yeah, we are. But he's such a thoughtful kid. But he's fucking an emotional, you know. He's just a bag of emotion. But I'm that way too. Yeah. So anyway, but yeah, we have that same kind of dynamic going on. And there's also the you know the father son dynamic is an yeah. interesting one because it's almost like there's an echo to life, right? Yeah. So my son is a he's at Temple as a freshman. COVID hits because he's a 2020. Uh, graduate right and from high school and it's a mess and he's got a high school sweetheart and they're dating and she goes away to school you can hear this coming right yeah and they break up yeah and it's there it's like, devastating if, if he's like my best friend there's one message for him yeah i can't tell him as his father what i want to tell him if he was my best friend yeah right you know, and, but I was, I, I actually said to him and it, you know, probably a little bit much, but it was like, yeah, same thing happened to me, brother. Yeah. It, it hurt like hell. And my wife is in the kitchen and as I'm having this conversation, I pointed and I said, but, but there's the result. Right. After that's the aftermath, right? Yeah. And that, it's, that's a way, bad way of putting it, but like things happen for yeah. a reason, man. And, yep. and I also like, I'm like later on, I said, you know, the parents are crazy. And if the parents are crazy, especially the <laughs> yeah. mother really fucking crazy. You look, what? and you look at her ankles. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. if she has fat ankles, she's yeah. she's going to she's going to grow old, but not yeah. gracefully. Yeah. So you know, being a dad's great, and it's like different phases to it. Like you get that like little yeah. phase. Yeah. And now I'm in the empty nest phase, and my son's in Colorado, and my daughter's here in the city. Yeah. And she's working. Um, she got her degree. She's working. She's probably going to go on and get either a master's or PhD. Yeah. She's way smarter than everybody else. So that's a different dynamic because she comes yeah. over and, you know, we have, have dinner together and we hang out we, and, and the conversations are completely, it's, I'm like talking to an adult. Yeah. I'm like, I, and then it's like, I say to my wife all the time, I'm like, we made these things. It's like, how, yeah. do, how the hell do we do this? Yeah. There's some pride in that. Yeah. 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 It'd be all right. Like they're, you worry about your kids, but what do you do? You wind them up, point them in the right direction. And you just like hope for the best, right? Yeah. So, you know, my son's a senior, so I'm getting ready to push him off into the world. <laughs> you have any advice for me? Cause I'm really tortured by it right now. So when my dad, uh, my dad and I had a complicated relationship, but it was a very close relationship. But when I went away to school, we get my stuff all up and we get downstairs and we both break down and hug at the bottom, <laughs> at the bottom of steps in front of about 50 girls. It was, for, well, they, it was adorable really, yeah, yeah. but yeah, good move. it was a good move. It was a good move. Um, but in any, in any of that, but so like, I feel like I'm going to wind up just be a goddamn bloody mess when he walks out this door Yeah, it's, in, a, it's, in a year. It's, it's natural. Somebody's going to be. Yeah. We took my daughter to, to college. Like my wife was, it was, it was bad. Yeah. Um, but I, I think, you, you know, running water will go where it wants to go. Yeah. And your kids are like that. They're, and let them. Right? right. I think that, you know, my generation, there was an expectation like you went to, you went to school and then you get good grades and you went to college and then you got a job. Well, then you get a job and you're miserable. Right. You know, so. And while yeah. you're young and you're not connected, and I've I've told them both, it's like before you get tied up in a relationship, before you get tied up in a mortgage and car payments and all that bullshit, have fun. Have fun. Yeah. Go do stuff. Be you know, get a wild hair up your ass. As, as long as nobody gets killed, nobody gets pregnant. You're good. You know, it's like you're all good. Do you know this guy Gary V? He's on the internet. You know that dude? Yeah. Yeah. So he talks about that. You know, taking chances in your twenties, and I'm trying to convey that to my son right now. I sort of. Uh, not on purpose, but he has 
he wants he wanted to go to NYU. His his dream is NYU film school, and I just gave him a little bit of a reality check that if you don't get if you don't get a scholarship there, it's a mortgage for thirty years. Yeah. Where you know I went to law school and I did it fairly cheaply, and it was a car payment for thirty years. Yeah. Right. So, and I think I stunted his enthusiasm, and I didn't want to do that. That wasn't the point. But the point is to look at other options. There's a million other options. But what I'm trying to convey to him is that take a million chances. Who cares? Come back and live with us and go off again and figure it out. Yeah. And, you know, do you have a place to come? Yeah. Yeah. My, my son didn't finish the school at Temple. He left. Yeah. He's out in the South. He's out in um, Colorado right now working for the Southwest Conservation Corps. Awesome. He's cutting trees down, and he's they he, they promote him. He's a leadership role. He's twenty one. Yeah, you know he's learning skills today as a twenty one year old in an environment they're going to be priceless when he gets older. Yeah, absolutely. And, and he's seen he's seen beautiful part of the country. Right. He's meeting people he wouldn't meet in the little sound box that he was living in. And now, right, he's not in front of a fucking computer all the time. Right. So it's like God bless you, buddy. You yeah, know, man. Go, go have an experience. Yeah. Because yeah, again, when it's all said and done, what does it matter if you take the diploma in the coffin? What the fuck does it make a difference? None of it matters. None of it matters. Yeah, you're here now, right? You're an empty nester. Yeah. How's that feel? It's it's like the six years before you had the kids that should have been. Yeah. I have money. Yeah. But I'm tired. <laughs> right. <laughs> Adderall. Adderall, Rick. <laughs> Sorry. No, it, 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 we've been traveling. We downsized. Um, yeah. Sold the big house in the burbs. We we both work here in the city, so we decided we bought a condo here in the city. Yeah. I get, I think I get the best view in the city. Thank you. Yeah, you got a great one. Thank you, fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the 4th of July was really awesome. Yeah. And, um, you know, you can go away for the weekend, and you don't have to worry about, like, the lawn and, yeah. and all the chores and crap like that. Yeah. Um, my admin... She she busts my balls. She lives up in Fishtown, and she's like, "You're not a city resident." She's like, "You don't have to worry about like getting the trash out the right way and putting it in a bag in the right place, and you don't have to worry about parking your catalytic converter stolen." She's like, <laughs> "She's like, you can just drop your trash in a trash chute. You got doormen. You have got a garage. It's amazing, yeah." But it, you know, and we're doing a lot of stuff. We, um, you know, we're really conscientious about the fact that it 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 we have this motto: it, it's us against the world. Yeah. And that's, we've, we really, if, if you're not careful, like I said, we had a lot of friends or marriages like blew up. Yeah. And, you know, I recognize there were some cracks, right? There was some stuff and, you know, compounding this. And I, I don't know if we, we've talked about this, but I'm a cancer survivor. Right? I, I do know that. Yeah. You know, and that'll mess you up in terms of like what's important in life. And it's like, no, we have to do stuff now. Yeah. Because tomorrow never knows. Like, Right, the Beatles, right? Yeah. So um, we've really embraced that. Yeah, and uh, we're having a lot of fun, man. That's awesome, man. So talk to me about that, about going through that experience, about cancer and the terrifying nature of it. I guess. Yeah. So I just started a new job. Yeah, the job I'm in today, um, one of the employer I work for, because the job really morphed and I got promoted. Um, so I was there about nine months, and I just wasn't right. Uh, yeah, and I had uh, I eventually what I was diagnosed with colon cancer. Yeah. You know, and you just know, like, um, your body's not right and not getting into the graph graphic details, but man, I was not right. Yeah. So I went in for a colonoscopy and I came out of it and the, uh, the doctor, the, um, gastro guy, man, he was awesome. He was the coolest cat ever. <laughs> he's a craft beer drinker and he's left actually the practice and he's working for pharma, but that's other story. He just looks at me, and goes, dude, we got a lot of work to do. He says, you got a tumor in her size of about a grapefruit. Oh, wow. So uh, I'm like, well, what is it? And he goes, well, we don't know if it's cancer yet. So, yeah. okay. So that's Halloween. I get, and my wife's all jazzed up. She made her own costume for Halloween that year. She loves Beaker. And she made a Beaker com <laughs> I love uh, costume. Yeah. And uh, so surgery and surgery was rough. Uh, I had a reaction to anesthesia. It was kind of, kind of tough coming out. So, um, Go in to see surgeon afterwards and still don't know pathology wise. It's a chance it could be benign, could be cancer. The resident comes in, not the doctor. And, and this is missed no bedside manner. Yeah. At all. 
she comes in and she goes, well, you know, you have cancer and we're going to have to do something about it. And there's a <laughs> doctor's following her in. Uh, the look on my face, Dave. Um, I'm sorry to laugh, but that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. Like, we're going to have to do something about it. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no, thanks. No shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I was lucky it didn't leave the colon. And then I had the greatest, uh, like location and, and timing are everywhere. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. So I just switched my primaries to pen practice. Yeah. So I had the, the head of oncology actually read all of his papers yeah. and his path for, you know, my treatment, no chemo, no radiation. It was just surveillance. He said the, the, the type of cancer you had, it's either going to go to your lungs or go to your liver in two to three years, or you're going to be fine. So I, I dude, those CAT scans every six months for six Oh. Yeah, terrifying. Yeah? yeah, not not good at all. And it, it really changed me as a person. It affected all my relationships. You know, I got some close friends prior. Yeah. They ain't, they ain't the same. Really? And then I got a handful of friends that I've made since that they're my dearest friends ever. And tell me about that. Explain that to me. I, I think that people just can't confront their mortality. Yeah. I right. just don't know how to react to it. Yeah. You know, and, you know, it, it was even, it was a strain in, in a relationship as well, within a marriage, which my wife is the most upbeat person ever. There was never a doubt in her mind that I was going to beat this. Right. And I'm like, you, you don't know, you know, there's, yeah, there's, yeah. so there was a lot of stress in that. But the big takeaway for me was, like I said, tomorrow never knows. You, you get it. Do the stuff today that, you know, you want to do. It doesn't matter, you know? Right. And, and and I let a lot of stuff go today that I used to not let go, man. Yeah. I'm trying. I'm Rick, I'm I'm getting there. I'm tr I'm trying. Well, I'm I, trying to be less angry. I, I hope I hope you don't have that you know, the the dance with with the devil that I did. No, no, it's an awful dance. You know, you talk about timing and stuff. I was it makes me think about my dad. Not that my dad smoked many packs of cigarettes a day for a very long time so that was the generation my friend yeah i know but he you know he but he you know my buddy he changes to my buddy he, he has the same cough the same problems he can't breathe they just call an emphysema it's been five six years and I, finally i said dad you need to go to somebody else like something and he goes to my buddy uh, charlie who finally gets him a fucking ct scan which isn't which, you know, I find out is, you know, not even the standard of care. It's just an x-ray. The x-ray doesn't ever show anything. The CT scan so, shows stage four cancer. If he has a CT scan four or five years earlier, they catch it early. Yeah. And, you know, and he probably is still alive. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but again, time, just timing, you know, just it's frustrating. But again, you know, my your colon cancer is a whole lot different than my father's uh, lung cancer that, was a hundred percent caused by something that could have been avoidable. But you know, it's funny. It's genetics is funny, and that um, you know what your parents will and won't tell you. My dad had diverticulitis in quotation mark, yeah, and had major surgery for it. I guess when I was in middle school, they lied to me. I'm convinced they, that that was the he had a tumor and a tumor because yeah. his grandfather died. Yeah, and his mother died of breast cancer, and his sisters, two of them, died of, of breast cancer. So, like that gene is just like swimming around in my yeah. Brain. So yeah, uh, I got. I, this is the best time alive to be alive, man. It is, man. Medicine wise, it is. Yeah, it is. All right, so talk to me about next five or ten years. What's RPG's plan? Oh, I don't. You know what I do for a living, and I can complain about it to people. Yeah. But it's like, you know, the longer you, you wrestle with a pig, the more you realize a pig likes it. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's and, true. And I really enjoy what the hell I do. Yeah. Um, I probably got five to seven years left. Yeah. And then I want to do some consulting work. I want to travel. Yeah. I absolutely want to travel. Um, I want to get back and play more music. I don't play enough. I want to do that more. And, and just hopefully, you know, be there for my kids. Yeah. Know, and experience their things. Their and, things, yeah. Yeah, be with them. Be present. Talk to me about your relationship with music. You you were played in bands over the years. Yeah, yeah. You're a bassist. Yeah, my son's a bassist. He taught himself to bass, by the way. I did too. Did you? Yeah, send him for lessons. Yeah, he's got to learn some theory. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It challenges. I actually can teach them theory. I, you, do you know this about me? I went to uh, music school for eight years. Oh, I didn't know that. So from fifth to twelfth grade, I went to Gerard Academic Music Program. Nice camp, the twenty second arena, right down the street here. Okay. Um, but so I actually know music theory very well. Well, if you're good at math, like music theory to kind yeah. of together because it's kind of related. Yeah. So for me, it's especially as I've gotten older, it's like I can listen to almost anything. Yeah. Almost anything. Almost. Almost. We might get into that eventually. Yeah. So you know, look, I love like stripped down live performances yeah me too man one of my favorite things growing up was i got a copy of chess records greatest hits it's a you know the blues guys yeah out of uh you know out of chicago yeah and you put that on you listen through it in the headphones it's so raw you can literally hear people talking in the studio behind these guys yeah and they they're not always perfect but it's a it's the heart yeah it hits the, yeah. the heart yeah that's I always talk about when my love of music is anything that hits me. Like I, it doesn't have to be a genre or, a, you know, I don't have at, well, at least at this point in my life, but it just, if, if it hits me in the chest, yeah, I, I don't know any other way to explain it, but other than it, I feel it, you know? Yeah. And that's, I think it's a piece of me that I love playing the bass is because it, the bass moves the music. The bass music. And- I, it gets the girls dancing and it gets you laid later. So yeah, it's 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 amazing. I told I told my son I don't know if he took this to heart, but I said if you don't learn how to play the bass, you'll always find a band because no everybody wants to be the lead guitarist, everybody wants to be the singer, nobody nobody's good at rhythm. So yeah, um, yeah the bass is an amazing, and everybody wants to, and then the other part is guys like me that want to fucking bang on things. Yeah. Right, so the drummers, right? So, but the bassist is the dude that's like the cool dude in the back that's just keeping the beat, man. Keeping the drummer out of trouble. Yeah, keeping the drummer out of trouble, right? <laughs> exactly, but, right. You know, for me, music is there's been like phases of my life where it's been the soundtrack. Yeah, you know, and there's also periods of time. As much as I love music, there were you know like that eighty six, eighty seven with the breakup and all that. There was a bunch of songs that it took me forever to listen to again. Yeah, there was just such strong associations with some of that music. I, yeah, I couldn't listen to it. Yeah, and there there's songs that really like you to bring me back to a day, you know, a day where you've been. You know, actually, it's a strange song, but "Father and Son" you by uh, Scott Stevens yeah. is a song that really means a ton to me because it's it's both my relationship with my dad and my relationship with my kids. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's an amazing song. I love it. I'll get teary eyed thinking about it, but I, I just yeah. Well, we, we all have them, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and and there's I could rattle off a bunch of songs like the whole Quadrophenia album by the Who. <laughs> yeah, it's like the soundtrack of my teens. It's an it, amazing album, yeah. uh, absolutely. And then you know there was Bad Companies feel like making love. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't listen to that for years, Dave. Really, I could not so because there, yeah. And then. Um, uh, what was the one by Journey? Not, it's not. It'll come to me. Uh, one of the other super ballads. Yeah. But, but anyway, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's just songs. It's just like um, they just they just get you. You get know? you and and bring you back to an exact moment. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you know, like of all things, like Queens, the game reminds me of like going to youth group in church right. for whatever reason. Yeah, uh, that album. But yeah. All right. So let's talk about some advice. Well, first, what advice would you give the 18-year-old version of you? Just keep working out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I gave up. You know, I was a monster coming out of my senior year in high school. I bet you were, yeah. And, you know, I was ripped. And then I got mono at the end of my senior year. And then uh, then I, like, just kind of – it was hard not, not playing ball. So, yeah, keep, you know, keep up your fitness. Yeah. And forgive yourself. Yeah. I think that's the big one. I take take the the working out and put that aside. Forgive yourself. It took me a long time to forgive myself about things. Yeah, forgive yourself for not being perfect. I mean, yeah, yeah. none of us are, yeah. right? Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. How about what what does the eighteen year old version of you think of the empty nester? What, what's he think of you right now? Oh, he's really happy. I think. Yeah. I I think he's pretty happy with with the fact that it's just you know I'm out doing stuff and I'm actually have a you know. 
I'm getting laid right here. Like. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Do you have any advice for parents just in general? We talked about it. Yeah. You know, as long as it's safe, let, let the journey go where the journey's going to go. Yeah. How about for husbands? Put the fucking seat down. <laughs> 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 well, and it's also that I think, I mean, that's the cliche, right? Yeah. But let your w wife be who she is. Yeah. Let her have her interests, let her have her friends, you know, and, and encourage her to, to do new things. Yeah. That's a great advice. And yeah. And just be a supporter, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Stop with your ego. It's not about always about you. Never. Never. Yeah. How about any advice for I actually want to ask you advice for anybody that's hiring somebody because I feel like I got the greatest advice ever from you about that. Man, what did I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what do you hire for? Attitude. 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 Yeah. Every time. Yeah. Um, and you got to find a way to have a real dialogue with the people that you're interviewing. Yeah. Interviews, people can act. Yep. And you've got you've to find a way to ask some questions that are, are going to, without getting you in trouble with HR, but really get to who they are. Yeah, about the person. Yeah. Yeah. And my big, the, the question I, I really think is the most important is tell me about something that went wrong professionally and how did you handle it? Yeah. Not the best days of your job, not the, all the accomplishments, but when it was bad. Yeah. Tell me about that. That'll tell you a lot about people. Yeah, that's great. So you, the, one of the things that I got from you uh, that I, I use every day or and I tell people all the time is that your resume has gotten you into the interview. Yep. So all of the, your accomplishments don't really matter. It's whether do you fit into this organization? Can I deal with you? Can, can we get along? And do you have the right attitude of being here? Right? Do you have that can-do attitude? Are you going to make excuses for everything or, you know, again, it's, it's one of the best of professional advices I've ever gotten it was from you. And I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. And I, I, I've interviewed for positions recently and, and I talked myself right out of a job because I just smelled bullshit yeah. on the other end. And, and I, and I called them on it. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge organization and it's the CFO and I, yeah. I called them on it. You know, Rick, I, I've, I've been fairly successful in my career, but I I didn't know my worth until now, like three days ago. Yeah. I mean, s seriously, I you know my career. I meandered around yeah. at a lot of places, and I've finally come to a point where that can happen for me. That I'll talk myself out of a job, and the money doesn't isn't necessarily that important. It's going to be the the environment and whether I can uh, excel at it and whether I can move up or whether it's the right situation for me. It's all about satisfaction. Yeah. You spend is. so much time in it. And so yeah. here, here's an interesting like thing. I get to work with the, the, the Brits a lot, right? The London markets. Yeah. And the question that Americans ask people when they meet somebody new, what do you do? Yeah. The Brits don't ask that question. They ask the question, what keeps you busy? <laughs> what keeps you busy? It's and a great then, question. And then when you ask a Brit that, yeah, they won't tell you about their job. They will tell you about their their hobbies and what's at their core. Yeah. And and that's what we gotta find a way to understand that about each other as an Americans, right? Yeah. Especially as professionals. Yeah. We get we self identify with our professions. Too and, much, and it, it, yeah, and it's like you're prof the the legal profession. They're the worst at it. They are the worst at the it. Worst. Them and them and doctors, yeah. the doctors and lawyers are the worst at it. Yeah, but it, at the core, what are you? What is it that you love? It's like I love what I do for work, but man, I'm passionate about so many other things. Yeah, I we had this uh, town hall meeting at work. Oh, those suck. Yeah, they suck. <laughs> so it was. I didn't, I had to be a little bit a part of it but i didn't have to speak but all the vps and the general manager spoke and one of the general managers said that his interest right now because he was new to the area was just work that was that scares the fuck out of me yeah like that can't be true 
Y- yeah. I mean, if it is, that's sad. I mean, I feel like it's sad. I don't know. It is sad. And what what are people going to say at at your funeral? Yeah, no, nobody cares about the money or the work. No, no. It's it's can somebody once said to me that the the success and the value of your life is the quantity of the people who miss you when you're gone. I think that's right. You, right. It's what you said about professional just making an impact right just making impact on people regardless of who who they are or where they are in your life what else matters nothing yeah tell me about any advice you got for young workers you want to tell these young people shave every day and tuck your shirt in <laughs> tuck your shirt in's nice <laughs> jesus christ no, I think, you know what's funny is that's it's really like a thing. Yeah. Like, like, well, I mean, I, I'm I'm, t- I'm dating myself, but I think, um, and there's so many things you could say to young workers. Your brand is everything. Yeah. And once you and it follows you forever. It does. So be guard your guard your brand. You your professional reputation is your brand. Yeah. Take pride in what you do. Right. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's. It's easy to be fa- you know, fairly successful if you just take pride. Yeah, not hard. And and which the conversely is, there's not a whole lot of people to take that much pride. Yeah. They just show up. And that's where we're at. Yeah, it is where we're at. How about a person that was most impactful to you? Who would that one person be or a couple of people? Any? Well, any? I mean, top of the list of my mom and dad. Yeah. I mean, because the, the example they set about – hard work and they sacrificed so that I could be where I'm at. So the top of the list, my wife, you know, yeah. positive uh, person I've worked for some, my, my boss today is probably one of the, he gets it. Yeah. If you're going to do one thing every day, just be kind. And yeah. he's got a horrific job when you think about what he does, Yep. but he's kind. Yeah. And he's fair. And, you know, I've been in some meetings with him and, He's a super smart guy yeah. and respectful and listens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's that's what I would tell people that are executives like that is be that. Yeah. And be that. Be be we we know you're smart. We know you make the decision. You can be respectful and listen. You don't have to agree, but actually listen. Yeah, so I mean, those those are kind of the people, and they all have the same kind of characteristics, right? They're they're just kind. Yeah. How about a an event that was most impactful? Is it what event would you say? Nine eleven. Really? Yeah. I, for me, it was the beginning of the end of my fire service career. Yep. I didn't know it. So, in kind of backing up from that, about three weeks before. Um, a member of my department, a guy that was like a jobber, you know, he'd be considered a guy in a jobber economy today. Yeah. He'd be, today he'd be the best Uber driver ever. He was, he was like our daytime fire driver, fire truck driver. Cause you're volunteer volunteers, right? Yeah. And never went to the doctor, never went to the doctor. He's 43. He responds in the ambulance call and he drops dead at the station three weeks before nine 11. Yeah. And that we bury him full, full fire department funeral. I mean, he, Funerals are bad. Go to a fireman's funeral. Yeah. Not good. Yeah. And I mean, and, and our department, I don't think ever really recovered after that. And then nine 11 happened. Yeah. And the, I don't cry often, but when the image of, they carried the, the priest to the chaplain in the fire department in New York, they carried him out and they laid him on the altar, man. Yeah. I lost it. Yes. I, I lost it. And then, then on top of that, there had been early that day when this is all going on, this thinking about there's going to be recovery. There's going to be a, a search. And they were they were looking for people to go to help. I remember it. Yeah. And and I came home from work and I told I, I didn't even say anything to Sharon. I just grabbed the bag and started packing it. And she's like, What are you doing? And I'm like, I'm going. And she just lost her shit. I mean, and the, the icing on the cake of this is I go to see my mom and dad that night. I walk in the door and I'm like, dad, what do you think? And he just looked at me and he goes, the last time we got sneak attacked, somebody got fucking nuked. That's all he said. 
And I was like, oh, my God, what the hell just happened? I mean, you want to talk about an impact. Yeah. Um, other things like more positive, like the birth of my two kids. Oh, of course. Yeah, you don't know. But, but, but I mean, that, that. I mean, 9-11 is probably the biggest impact on the world. For people who were around at that point in time. Yeah. But just think about, like, the direction. I mean, we could talk, like, foreign policy. Forever, forever yeah. Forever around, like, what happened. Bin Laden wasn't stupid. No, he wasn't stupid. He was, he knew exactly what he was doing. And, no, I mean, that's the problem, right? It's the problem is he wasn't stupid. And, and no, no. the other problem is that we propped him up because, so, because he wasn't stupid. <laughs> so I had to fly yeah. for work about four to six weeks after that. Yeah. So I go to Philly Airport, and they had had the National Guard there. Yeah. The police are there. State police are there. The, yeah. na- the National Guard are like, get us out of here. They're not interested. The Philly police, God love them. The only guy that was paying attention was the state trooper. And this is a big corn fed dude from like north of Harrisburg somewhere. <laughs> right. With this ch- yeah. the strap underneath yeah. his chin. Yeah. That football is, is life. Yeah. 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 I mean, everybody got the stink eye. Everybody from that guy. And I was like, well, I mean, a hand sitting on top of his yeah. service weapon. Rick, I remember, I remember like it's yesterday, the first time a plane flew after 9 11. I was in Philadelphia. I was in law school. I remember that day I, I got on the train. The first plane hit. I got on the train to go to law school. And by the time I got there, the second plane had hit and they had canceled class. And there was people because there's a lot of people from New York yeah. in Philadelphia. And going certainly going to Temple Law School because, uh, you know, there's not tons of law schools, so there's a ton of people who come down there. And people running out of there, fucking crying, because you know, and and not at the time I didn't think about it, but you know, thinking about it the day after is, you know, that people in the World Trade Center, and I walked all because I was afraid to get on the subway because there was there was uh, you know, reports that there's other planes in the air and they were going to attack. You know, big centers and Philadelphia. You know, Philadelphia is a con- where a constitution was born. So, you know, maybe we're we're the next. I remember um, driving home from work. I was working in King of Prussia at the time, and hearing that you know, both towers are down. Yeah. And in my head, I'm like thinking about New York City Fire Department's response. Yeah. And how many guys that is. And mm-hmm. I'm like, there's a lot of dead firemen. And yeah. Dude, I was angry. Yeah. I was really angry. So yeah, so. I go, my wife was working at the Irish pub on 20th and Walnut. So I walk from North Philly to 20th and Walnut and I go hang out there. I got there about 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning and I drank all day. I mean, all day. And the bar was packed because remember cell, cell towers were overwhelmed and everybody was trying to get out of the city at the same time. So it was gridlock. Yeah. So people literally just fucking pulled their cars over and were just in bars. Yeah. It was actually kind of in in a in, in a weird way like a community. Like it felt it, it felt you felt connected in some kind of way. And, and I think my dad, in his own kind of blunt way, yeah, right, marketing back to Pearl Harbor, and he he told a story of when he was a little boy when Pearl Harbor happened, and his brother ran in the door and just said the Japs just fucking bomb Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And that galvanized the country, right? Yeah. And and there's a piece of me that you don't you think about like how the country came together after nine eleven. I do, right? yeah. Look, where the hell are we now? I don't know. We're so far away from it. It feels like that was like the starting point and then we found ways to hate each other. You know, I mean we were so it was a wonderful thing to see people care about everybody and each other yeah. and New York. And rural Pennsylvania, you know what I mean? And we just cared about everything American. And then, I don't know. We all have the same instincts, right? Yeah. We want to be safe. We want our families to be safe. Yeah. You know, we we want shelter and and have food in our belly. Yeah. If we start looking at, like, the the things that make us common as human beings. Right. And put the other stuff aside, it gets a lot easier. Well, it is easy. It, it it is easy when you have real conversations with people, yeah. because nobody acts like that when they're face to face, and you realize that you're okay. Maybe you come out differently on a on a topic, maybe, but you're all coming from the same exact place. Yeah. So you might end up at a different place, you know, on the argument, but we all care about the same things, 
and we're all the same people. Yeah. And that's not even just here. It's throughout the world. Like you, you know, talking about traveling is the one thing you learn about traveling is yes, the cultures are different, but we're all the same and we all care about the same things. Well, that was one of the biggest takeaways I had from the trip to the Soviet union. We met a guy who just came back from Afghanistan. Yeah. He was, so, he was in the Soviet army and he just came back from Afghanistan. They had their dalliance there. Right. And just talking about he could have he could have been me. He was my age. Yeah. And he's you know he's got the same things, you know, he all, he wants to know he's got a, a secure future, a roof over his head, his loved ones are safe. That's all he wants. That's all that matters. Yeah. They we're all the same way and if I think if we kind of go back to that. Yeah. Uh, that's a rabbit hole, man. <laughs> yeah, it is a rabbit hole. We could talk for 17 hours. All right. I need a couple embarrassing stories. All right. I, you gave me a drunk story. That's fine. How about uh, any time you shit yourself? You ever shit yourself? I'm a colon cancer survivor. So, <laughs> so, so last right, summer, right. I'll give you a good this, this time last summer. My wife had always wanted to go to see the World um, uh, Track and Field Championships, and they're in Eugene, Oregon. Yeah. So we're out there. It's beautiful. This is her thing. This is, means everything to her. I come down with a stomach bug. We're literally at the the, the big stadium. Yeah. I'm like, I got to go to the bathroom. I don't feel good. I literally wind up throwing up and shitting myself at the same time, leaning over a trash can uh, at the stadium. That's awful. So we, st- we still talk about this. And I was wearing my favorite red underwear. At the time. <laughs> I call them my Zazzies. Your Zazzies. <laughs> Oh fuck! Only me asked the guy fucking colon cancer survivor if he ever so. Well, there you go. And, and look, it happens. I get a semicolon, so stuff happens. All right. Oh, that's awful. All right, how about a uh, time you caught someone having sex or got caught having sex? I caught my brother. Did you? Yeah, he was. He's two years younger, and his girlfriend was four years older. And yeah. in high school, like, and we shared. My, I don't know. My mom and dad ever think we had this Cape Cod modified cape. And the, my bed, my brother and I each had our own room on the second floor and there's this common area. So I go upstairs and like, I'm like, what the hell is this noise I'm hearing? And I like walk down to his room and like push the door open. And man, he is like going to that. <laughs> Just going at it. Yeah. He's like 16. That's amazing. I feel like his ass is really hairy. <laughs> at 16. Uh, all right. We're at my 20 questions. You ready? Shoot. All right. It's the Angry Dave podcast. What makes you angry? You know, people who just, I, I don't like dicks. Yeah. For the sake of being dicks. Yeah. Um, yeah, that makes, that pisses me off. Like, yeah. like it, it just be nice to people. The big one is like, if you are at a certain statute, like you're, don't talk down to people. Yeah. Don't do that. We, we all put our, we all shut ourselves the same way when you get old, you know, and it, so just yeah. be kind. Yeah. That's, that drives me nuts. Uh, how about what makes you happy? My wife. Yeah. Definitely music, um, the beach. Kate May Point, freaking love the beach. Are you are you like a hang out on the beach guy or do you like to go in the water? What's your deal on the beach? I love the water. Yeah, me I, too. I love being in the water. Yeah, me too. We came from the water. I want to go back to the water. Yeah. You, we got to go on jet skis sometime. Oh, yeah. I have jet skis in North Wildwood, so it's not that far away. Oh, dude down we're there all right what makes you most proud what are you most proud of i love my kids definitely my kids how about if uh you could have done anything else professionally what would it have been i would have played bass guitar in acdc brother <laughs> yeah fucking right uh if you could change any one thing about your life what would it be any regrets anything you would change so I talked about the guy that died at a heart attack. Yeah. I had a really bad conversation with him before he died. My last conversation with him was not good. Yeah. And, and you know, what? testosterone fucks us guys up. It does. And I was just being a macho prick. Right. And I was a dick to a guy, and he was dead two weeks, two, two days later. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. I want that one back. Uh, one thing you could change about the world? Just people just be kind. Yeah, you know, just take just take a minute and just take a deep breath and, and just be kind to one. What's the biggest problem with that? What do you think? What are, what are we suffering from the most? Is it just self-absorption? I mean, what, or is it 
the internet. I, mean, I, I think it's a combination of things. I think the internet has created the space for these echo chambers. And yeah. then COVID really think about it. Like we drove ourselves into these closed environments. I, I think it was the right thing to do early. Right. But yeah, me too. And I got to tell you though, people just don't know how to interact with each other anymore. It's, it's just, and we're humans. We're social animals. We have to be social. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. It's just like, that's what's wrong with us. We just learned that we, we've lost the fact that we have to have community. That's the yeah. thing. I talk about this, like you go to concerts and you watch people watching the concerts through the video screen of their phone. Fucking stupid. Be there. Like you want to talk about events I can remember so clearly. Yeah. December 8th, 1981 at the Spectrum. I saw the first concert I ever saw. I saw ACDC. Yeah. I can remember that night like the back of my hand. Yeah, man. Because I was there. I felt it. Yeah. Today, you you don't do that. If you get the stupid phone, it's lost on you. I, I don't even understand it because, again, you can find video of it if you want. It, it, it's actually the same thing as when I go to the car show. Like I, I try to go to the car show every year, and there's people that stand by the cars that take pictures of, of the cars while they're standing by them. But they literally, you can go grab a picture of the car next to it because they're trying to give you the brochure anyway. Right, right. What are you doing? Just fucking enjoy enjoy the atmosphere. Yeah, and that, that's where I'm at. Like, and a cancer survivor, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, I have a low tolerance for wasting time. <laughs> right, right. Like, I just absorb it. Like, I just, I try to tell my kids that. I told my niece that on this last podcast. Just take it in. Get off the fucking phone. And uh, listen, I do it too. I, I love the phone. I love social media. I love watching TV. But there are times where you just need to take it in. That's the experience. Yeah. And, and that, you know, like from a beach experience. Yeah. You know, the sun going down in, in Cape May. Yeah. You know, that is the most glorious thing. And you just you listen you feel it, you smell it. Yeah. And it's just glorious to me. It is, yeah. It's quiet. Yeah. So relaxing. And slow. Yes. Yeah, I like time, that. Time stands still. Yeah. How about what's most important to you? Family. Yeah. I'm a, look, I'm Scottish. <laughs> right. You know, we're clannish, right? Right. <laughs> that's, that's, and, and that's funny because, like, the, my father's side of family, the, the Scots, they're fucking brawlers, man. Yeah. But love each other. So, yeah. 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 Punch each other in the face and then kiss 10 yeah. minutes later. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love that about the Scottish. How about the most unreasonable thing about you? The, the fact that I can put 40 pounds on in a freaking blink of an eye and lose it in like a oh. blink of an eye. It's, I hate that about myself. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I I can't lose it anymore, by the way. I'm really struggling. I, I used to be exactly that person. I can put it on now, bro. Yeah. Oh, fuck. An everyday struggle that you have? You're going to laugh. But I, I have a bad case of imposter syndrome. Really? I do. I can't believe I am who I am and where I'm at. Still, though? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm better. Yeah. I'm better. I mean, and, and it was, it, 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 it actually, it's crept into my marriage. I'm like, I'm not good enough for this one. Yeah. And that, that's probably the biggest one. And it, like, I, I feel like I work on that. And it's, you know, early on, my mission statement was always make her happy. Right. And I've like, I really doubled down on that again. Like make her happy. Make her happy. Yeah. It's, it's funny to think that it's, it's, it's funny to think that you, that you have that. I feel like you're so good at your job. You're so confident and, and in your own skin that it's, but I, I get it. I mean, I've, so I suffer from the same, I, I suffer from me. It, it's imposter syndrome. Like I, like I don't belong here, you know. You know what I mean. Like I, I, uh, I should be, you know, I should be, a, you know, a unemployed construction worker. That's who I am. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, that's also what makes me very angry when people treat me like that. Yeah. So. Well, I also look around like in terms of my family, like of my my brother and my cousins, and yeah, I, I am so much further ahead. Than, than they are. Right. So, I mean, I, I think that, that 
there's a lot. There's a lot there, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, Rick. <laughs> That's another four hour podcast. All right. How about your best quality? What do you think your best quality is? I, I'm loyal. Yeah. Man, am I loyal to people? Yeah. The type of music that you hate. Oh my God. Like anything that's computer generated anymore. <laughs> it's, it, and I'm not going to pick on a specific genre. Yeah. No, I appreciate that response. That's actually the first response like that that I got. And I appreciate it and agree with it 100%. There's no feel to it. There's nothing. Like, I mean, I'm not a huge rap fan or I'm a huge country fan. Right. But this, if it's real, if it's a real performance and, right. and people are doing it and no auto tune. Right. Thank, I mean, you listen to like Freddie Mercury singing, there was no fucking auto tune. Right. You know, it's. Yeah. Like, yeah. So it's the stuff that's the, the. And that's what makes it great too, because it's imperfect and that's okay. He screwed up on Bohemian Rhapsody in the piano part. There's an error in that song. Yeah. Uh, how about a type of music? What, what, what's your favorite type of music? I'm a classic rock guy, man. Yeah. Yeah. Would you, do you have a favorite band? I get a couple. You know, it's like, it, it depends on the day. Like, I get the big five. I get ACDC. I get Iron Maiden. I get The Who. I get Springsteen's in there. Yeah. That's four. That's four. Uh, That's all right. Rush. So, Rush. I was I was only at one Springsteen concert, and it was, like, mind-blowing. He's an amazing live musician. And that the band the band is an amazing live band. I took my daughter to see him. That's the first concert she ever went to see. <laughs> They're shut, shutting down the spectrum. The last show's at the spectrum. That's hey, the born, he plays the whole Born in the USA album. Yeah. He starts with Seaside Barside, which he hadn't song, which he hadn't played in years. Yeah, yeah. I walked out and I said, Leia, I'm sorry. You're never gonna see a show like that ever again. That's true. That was one of his longest concerts, wasn't it? Four hours. Yeah, that's unbelievable. Yeah, he's a, uh, he, he's in the seventies. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's he it, it, and the, like the Nebraska album. Yeah, if you like ask me about like you know as a musician, that's a great album. It's him. It's yeah. a four track. Yeah. It's acoustic and harmonic in his bedroom. You're right, and his poetry. Yeah. Yeah, he's an amazing musician, and he 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 like he lives it. Yeah, you know, it's, I, I appreciate anybody that like lives that stage performance. Like, I actually went and saw a Sting concert one time. Yeah, not impressed. Yeah, yeah. like he was just like he he sung his songs and he went home. I mean, it's just what happened. I can't do that. And we walked out of Madonna. We saw her really, and it was she was first night of the of the tour. Had technical problems. He started way late. Yeah, and she was such a she's just not nice about it. Yeah, that's fucking shitty. All right, how about if you would could meet anybody, dead or alive, who would it be? Or talk to somebody? It doesn't have to necessarily be a dead or alive. Yeah, anybody. Can I give you two? Yeah. So alive, like I want to have a drink with Brian Johnson from ACDC. Okay, that dude's a storyteller, and he's, yeah. he's a funny dude. Um, dead. Yeah. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Who's that? He was the lieutenant colonel in charge of the 20th Maine who saved the Union Army, Army on day two of Gettysburg. Okay. He They charged, they fixed bayonets and charged down a hill and drove the second Alabama back. The guy was, um, he was a pacifist. Yeah. He was a professor at Bowdoin College. Wow. He's wounded during the war, decorated. They think he was going to die. He lives. He's a governor of Maine. This dude, unbelievable human being. I'd love to have met him. Yeah. How about anybody like like personally that you would that has gone and passed that you would want to talk to? I I want to talk to my dad again. Yeah. Yeah. Just just an, he was a great guy. And I miss him. Yeah. Yeah, me too. We had, we had a complicated relationship, but I I would want to I would want to have one last argument with him. My father, at least. I, I, I'd want to. I no. I'm, maybe this I'm plays kidding. into the imposter syndrome, but I'd, I'd want him to see who I am today. Yeah, I know he's proud of me. I know I know where he's at, and he's proud of me, though. Right. Yeah. How about a karaoke song? What's your favorite karaoke song? Well, I can't sing it, but don't stop believing. Come on, that's fucking amazing. <laughs> that's an amazing song. Yeah. Yeah, I would never try to sing that. If I had a million dollars, it's a good one too. It is a good one. You and I had a text about that. And I saw the bare naked ladies last week. Yeah. They have been on my play I've been playing them 
but so much fun. So I, I, what, I want, I went to several of their concerts. Uh, I love them. I love them as a band. I love them in, in late nineties. And, uh, yeah, it's me and my buddy, Frank Demizio, former cop. He works for the federal government now, but we used to sing, we used to sing it as a duet all the time. It's awesome. Yeah. It's I, yeah. I, I would sing the, uh, the higher uh, part, whatever that one was, uh, the lead singer. I don't, is he still the lead singer? Yeah. 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 But I love, I love those guys. Uh, it's fun. It's fun catching music. I mean, yeah. it's just fun catching music. Yeah. All right. If you were arrested, what would your friends and family think happened if they didn't know? The Brits finally dined them out on an insurance deal. <laughs> <laughs> it, would be, it would be white collar. It would That'd be a white collar crime. It would be white collar. <laughs> That's funny. Your favorite place you've ever been or uh, a place where, you know, like your happy place, something like that. My happy place is Cape May. Yeah. It would, and I, actually out on the point, I got to qualify it. Cape May is awesome, but you got on the point where the lighthouse is. Yeah. It's the Bayside. It's, yeah. It's dead quiet, man. Yeah. So, Rick, you got to come. I, I, we're going to make a date where your wife uh, comes down to my place. In It's in Cumberland County, but it's East Point. Yeah. It's East Point Lighthouse. Yeah. It, but you don't want to go there now because there's bugs, lots of, <laughs> lots of disgusting bugs. But in September, October, November, it's amazing. Yeah. It's quiet. You see a billion stars. Uh, the lighthouse is beautiful. So you were talking about favorite places, and you said stars. We we went to um, Hawaii, I guess in 1988, and yeah, 1998 rather, and um, we took this tour. It's August, the end of August. We go up on top of this volcano to this observatory. Yeah, there's they they're very strict about light pollution. The sun goes down. We're above the clouds, and the amount of stars that yeah. come out. Yeah. I have never seen anything like it. I never see it again. Yeah. I was so, we're not alone. I had that. We are definitely not alone. Yeah. It's not possible, right? It, is it not. can't, it can't feel possible. Exactly. Yeah. All right. How about your favorite curse word? It's I use fuck like a comma. <laughs> <laughs> How about, do you have any like, like really like absurd, like, phrases anything that you use you know like i i you the fuck tart is a good one and then uh um i grew up in a very uh cursy environment in my <laughs> but i like uh like cum stain i like stain like i like to use stain at the end of things I, I don't have that but i have like these like isms my my wife calls them the gram isms yeah so like i like manhattans yeah my dad used to always say this about manhattans i say it all the time they're like tits One's not enough and three's too many. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. That's good. How about your favorite sound? What's your favorite sound? I love the ocean. Yeah. Least favorite sound? Anything? At music. I don't, I don't yeah, baby. Bad music's pretty good. Or crying babies. Oh, in it. Oh, yeah. Or Karen's. Karen, oh, the Karen's. Don't get me started on the Karen's. Please. <laughs> It's All funny because right. my sister in law's name is Karen. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. It's funny. <laughs> All right. Last question I have for you. When it's all said and done, what do you want to be remembered for? He's was, he was kind. And he was a man of his word. And you got what you got. Yeah. Not pretentious, brother. You're not pretentious, man. Yeah. I appreciate that about you. You're uh you're a straight shooter. Uh love you. Love that you accepted me as a as uh, dysfunctional as I am. Um, and I appreciate our friendship and your, d despite the fact that you might not know that, but d d the fact that you're a mentor to me, and I appreciate it. Uh, that, uh, that's huge, man. I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Do you have any questions for me? For, <laughs> for my little chubby self? How the fuck did you get that beautiful woman to marry you? I have no idea. I mean, you know, we, <laughs> it's magic. She, uh, you know, she, uh, uh, she was. Uh, she went as far away from she can go from home, and I was nice to her. I love the story. Um, it's a great story, and people should tell their origin stories about the relationships. Yeah, I, that that's important to me. Yeah. Um. So the other thing is, where are you going to be in ten years? Where am I going to be in ten years? You want my job in ten years? Uh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if yeah, I would probably consider that. There you go. I don't know. Actually, I so 10 years I will have 
I will have two kids. Well, my one will be way off, and my other one will be in college. So, uh, you know, it's either that last that last professional job that I have, right? Yeah. It's either that one, or I have moved. I have retired from professional life, and I'm bartending somewhere and just working three, four days a week, making ends meet and just living. So we should open a bar together at the shore. I fucking, I would, yes, I would, I almost did it. (laughs) That's almost happened last summer, but the guy wanted too much money. So, but that almost happened. But yes, because that is, I would love to do that. Either the shore or Florida or wherever, just, you know, I'll be the the old dude at the bar to just shoot shit with people, serves them some drinks and doesn't work that hard. Do it in the summer and then take care of the homes during the winter. Yeah. Get all the leads and say, hey, my job during the winter is look after your place. Yeah. That'd be nice. I, I like like I like being a professional. I like being good at things and and making a difference, but I don't ever want it to define me. You know? Don't. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm the notorious RPG. Yeah, that's why you are. You that's know why. you know you know who gave me that. I do. I do. I love her. Yeah, I don't know if we can. Well, it starts with an A. She used to be an attorney. Yeah, you should get her on here. I would love to get her on oh here. Oh my god, Dave! <laughs> She's got some stories. I know that. Oh, so wait, she was present uh, right before I decided I was done with practicing law. But you know this, I was done with practicing law several times. Yeah, but yeah. this is the final time. So I had a client, uh, and she was on the uh, she was defense side. And this client was literally like, uh, she she was picking up books and faking that she couldn't hold the books. She was like, like it was ridiculous. It was fucking absurd. And she had a decent case. So I I told Miss A, I said, I need a minute. Um, I'm going I'm going to leave the room. The depositions <laughs> depositions stopped. I take her out of the room, and I yelled at this lady for five minutes and I said I don't know what the fuck you're doing but whatever that thing was that you just did with this woman in this room is destroying your case (laughs) so stop doing it just answer the motherfucking questions and I'm I'm cursing and her bad and that was that was one of the first points that I knew that it was time to be done and then there was a couple other ones, and then one where I told a dude I was going to bite his neck off if he showed up in my office. But <laughs> but he did threaten me. In fairness, Rick, he did threaten me and said he wants to come and beat me up because I called him to ask him if he wanted to settle his case. That's awesome. That's <laughs> and I said, I don't know who you think you're talking to, but I will fucking bite your neck if you show up here. I love it. So anyway, that was that. That's all, all good, my friend. All right, man. Thank you for doing this. I love it. I appreciate you. I appreciate your friendship. And uh, thank you. Thanks, brother. And for everybody else, until next time, I'm out. Peace.